Okay. Okay, this race is for State University Region District 4. Uh, we have uh, Stephen. Is it Stephen? Stephen, yes. Stephen Corbett and Allison Stevens. Mr. Corbett, we'll give you a minute to introduce yourself to sure. the uh, thank you for the opportunity. Turn it on, Mike. Oh, yeah. Sorry. Let me do that right. Thank you for the opportunity and the invitation to be here today. Um, my name is Savon Corbett. I was born and raised here in Las Vegas, Nevada. Uh, my background is in education. I was an elementary school teacher. I also did a lot of uh, social work and case management with youth and families in terms of reentry programs for youth. Uh, I taught physical education at the high school level as well. Uh, over the last couple of years, my background is in administration within nonprofits, uh, doing consulting as well for uh, community collaborations, looking at how to leverage resources to cut down expenses and recognizing that if we can work together collectively and have some shared resources, we could be more effective. Uh, I have three children. My wife and I uh, raised them. We feel there's a sense of responsibility that they have and that they owe to the community. And so one of the reasons why I'm running is to be that example and let them know that there is a responsibility and be involved with their community. Thank you, Mr. Corbett. Ms. Stevens? Well, I'm Allison Stevens and running for Board of Regents in District 4. Um, I graduated from the Clark County School District some years ago now. And um, just to give you a little bit about my background, I went off to a big private university in California and very quickly found out that I couldn't afford it. So luckily, I was able to come back home and transfer to UNLV, where I got an affordable education. I was able to study abroad in South America, which was one of my dreams, and ultimately get an undergraduate and graduate degree from UNLV. Fast forward a few years from there, and here I am today. Um, my undergraduate degree was in healthcare administration. My master's was in um, education, health promotion specifically. And I have a thriving career uh, at United Healthcare, and I am able to contribute to my community and to uh, the economy. Uh, I also have two small children, so that's a little bit of background about why I'm here, why I'm running, uh, because I'd like to contribute something to our education system. And while I know that I'm here for you to interview me, I'm also looking forward to hearing how you all feel that the, the Board of Regents can support the veteran and military family community in Nevada. That's time. All right, great. Uh, we'll move to questions and we'll start with Leo. Um, I don't know if you heard my question that I asked the previous person up there, um, but uh, in regards to the way that the regents choose to allocate budgets as far as, you know, cutting certain programs that may be more vital to the community than others, um, and then also the, the you know, people working at the, you know, the university system, making exorbitant salaries for very little work uh, in some cases. Like uh, Dina Titus was the example I'd give it, making 100000 for three hours a week of work. So am I starting? Sure. Sure. Okay. sure. okay. So I would agree that we need to be um, cognizant of what's going on in our community because, you know, the whole um, tagline of my campaign, if you will, is um, a trained workforce or an educated workforce for a stable economy. So I think that it's important that we realize that the Board of Regents and the higher education system is a huge contributor and a huge factor to how our economy is shaped uh, from the highest levels with you know doctoral degrees where people are creating jobs, uh, also down to people who are getting career and technical education at our community colleges so that they can contribute. So I would agree with you that there needs to be some comprehensive look at where we are as a society, where we are as an economy, uh, and which programs we're going to choose to cut, uh, which programs need to thrive, which programs maybe need to have a little bit more um, funding or bolstering so that we can continue to contribute. Uh, I'm not in a position to say that we should go against any employee contracts at this point, but certainly if there is something that's inequitable or unfair that should be reviewed. Uh, I'm not privy to that type of information at this point, but I do believe that we need to be cognizant of what's going on in our community in order to shape the economy for right. Nevada. That's time. Thank you. Jim? I'm sure. Yeah, I don't think. Yes, yes, oh, no, I'm sorry. Yes, yes. yes Mr. Corbett. Sorry. Thank you. That's fine. <clears throat> Excuse me. Uh, you know, uh, definitely, we need to reevaluate how we're looking at things. Uh, as we're looking at the current funding structure, uh, structure that's being presented, it, it's completely different from what we've had, which has been deemed as unfair. And so I think a lot of that funding structure in the past has dictated a lot of some of the ways, in, and so to some extent, it's been abused. And in the case that you gave, uh, 
what I look at is how it affects the students. And what we know is that there was an 8% increase on students over this past year. And so there were young people who couldn't continue their education, had to drop out, had to identify other resources. And so by that, that very nature, it impelled the opportunity for us to continue to have an educated workforce and to put the right support systems in place where we can have students who can go and get their education. And so uh, that, I think that's huge. And I think whatever we need to do to minimize that impact on the students as well as the faculty is number one. OK, this, this question is for both of you. I was you kind of brought it up earlier. You touched on it, so I, I'm going to ask it as a question. What, if either one of you, when you're elected to this seat, what can you guys do as far as community outreach would be to get those returning veterans to get them to want to come back to school and finish and get their degree? Well, I think the first thing is to make it an environment that is positive for veterans and for um, our military families. There are a lot of opportunities now for uh, families of uh, our veterans or military families to be able to come get an education. And we need to make that case to say, uh, here's an opportunity. We have the programming avail availability. We have um, programs that are going to be accessible because that's another issue, especially when we're talking about people who have children, have families, uh, have experienced time away from their families. It's important to have uh, classes that are going to be accessible, uh, classes that are going to be affordable, let them know about the financial aid options available to them as veterans. Uh, and so I think we need to go out there, make the case, uh, do the outreach, make sure that we're aligning ourselves and, and communicating to organizations like this. It's great to sit around in a room and talk to each other about how you want to outreach and how great it is, but unless you're using these community resources and people who are out in the field, people who are actually interacting with veterans and their families uh, and active military members, then we're not really going to get the message out there. So I believe in outreach within our community and Let's utilizing talk. our community resources. Thank you, Mr. Uh, my background is in community outreach, is what I've done for the past 15 years, and outreaching to youth and families and connecting them to the resources. There are so many resources we have, but oftentimes we do a very poor job about articulating what those resources are and the pathways to them. And so by continuing to engage in the relationships that I currently have, reach out to the community of the veterans, uh, Ms. Stevens is correctly right, make sure that the environment is conducive and supportive. Uh, you can look internally in terms of support systems that are in place for veterans, in terms of re-engagement and uh, maintaining that success. Also, we can't do it alone. Uh, again, going back to the collaborative approach, you must have everybody around the table. You must have them there to sit there. You must have uh, collective conversations. And then you have to be able to be held accountable and hold individuals accountable for what it is that they say. Uh, we can no longer be uh, you know, oblivious to what our fate is and where it's got us. And so I think by doing the same thing, we've continued, so we must change the way we're doing that. Yeah, I, well, I always found the veterans to do extremely well in the classroom. The question was, how are we going to protect the other students from their performance? <laughs> anyway, uh, well, one of the things the university needs to be doing is recruiting its faculty. The hires, I mean, you're looking at a 20 to 40 D year hire, ideally. Right now, I mean, it's inevitable, it's unavoidable that there's going to be some cuts in the budget. How do we recruit quality faculty with an eye to the future during this period and protect the university from the hit from that? Well, I won't um, come here to you today pretending that I know all the answers to this huge financial crisis. But I do think that the first thing is um, being innovative and creative in our approach. Uh, I think that the current sitting Board of Regents has moved in the right direction and looking at some creative um, options as far as tuition, because you can't have program cuts and then hire faculty to come teach for no class you know, anymore. Um, so I think that they've looked at different ways to fund these programs. Um, they've looked at charging tuition a little bit more to students who are in more expensive programs. So for example, a sociology student isn't experiencing a huge tuition hike to subsidize a nursing student who has equipment that may uh, cost a certain amount of money. So uh, I think that we have to look at that. We have to look at public-private private sponsorships while making sure that we protect the public nature of our institutions. Uh, and I think that we also have to protect PERS. I mean, that's a huge draw for um, employees to be able to come into the higher education system. Uh, we talk about tenure track people and they need security. You know, currently there, there are uh, professors and faculty who are actually engaging in departmental food banks because of the challenges that exist. Uh, and, and that's 
going to affect the overall learning environment of our students is going to impact everybody tremendously. And so in terms of the, the way you begin to multidisciplinary, look at the funding streams is how to support through K through 12. 25% uh, of our kids go on to higher education. We must be, rather than an, increasing the tuition, let's do more on the back end and make sure there's more participation in post-secondary education and that that quality exists. Uh, in terms of, there's research dollars out there, there's matching grant dollars that we currently don't engage in, that we can have that conversation and go after. And so there's a lot of support and infrastructure that's in place now. The conversations are just not happening. And so again, going back to that outreach, leveraging resources, having collective conversations, that's how we begin to change the scope of our funding streams and make sure it's fair for everybody. Next question. Thank you for attending today. How would you balance tuition increases, which have doubled in the last seven years, with budget cuts and taxes slash fees increases to ensure that no one segment of our community must shoulder a disproportionate share of the burden of education costs? Well, I think that um, that was a part of what we were discussing in the previous questions, that we have to diversify our income or revenue streams. Uh, we can't totally rely on the state budget the way that we have up to this point. Uh, and then with that state budget and the way that it's divvied out, you're seeing some proposals coming out right now about how we can change that, um, the way that it's uh, distributed among the, the institutions, uh, the programs that are funded. So there's a lot of ideas right now. And I guess at this point, I just think it's so important to uh, kind of leave everything on the table. I mean, as Mr. Corbett said, there's all sorts of research dollars out there. Uh, there are matching funds out there. There are other entities within our community that could be contributing to our higher education system. And so we do need to leverage those resources and make sure that we are ha that we have a diversified stream because we don't want to end up just getting out of this problem and waiting for the next um, you know problem to occur uh, yeah and just to continue most definitely there are a lot of things that the institutions have support to do they have numbers to be able to do so if you're looking at a HSI which is a Hispanic service institution you look at additional funding for other minority populations there's even additional funding for veteran groups that we don't go after and, and engage in and so let, let's let's look what's already on the table and let's begin to do it the resources are there we're just not having the conversations we're not engaging in that innovation and we're not reaching out quite frankly uh, you know I currently serve as president for the State Board of Education and one of the things I do is go and meet with uh, legislators I go and meet with community partners I go meet with business owners I make sure that there's a collective conversation because this affects all of us and so how can we all begin to get around the table and look at the strategically look at what needs to be done have that level of accountability and let's look for a strength-based approach so there are many resources out there that we just kind of lay live, uh, living on the ground that we're not picking up and it's time to pick those things up to offset some of that state funding <coughs> thank you this question for both of you uh, my memory tells me that the Board of Regents did a comprehensive review. Was it 10 years ago? The Nevada plan, what was it called? There's a plan out there where it was the primarily on uh, funding uh, allocations. How long ago was that? And uh, who has done a follow-up to see what recommendations in that plan were actually I think it's so important to recognize that right now we are in a unique situation that um, when you take a look back 10 years, I don't think any of us predicted that we would be facing what we're facing right now. And so while I realize that there may be some shortcomings, I think it's so important to, again, look forward, look to the future. Uh, we can go back and look at some of the key points, but also, like I said, we wanna make sure that we're not just um, settling for getting through this crisis. We wanna make sure that there's a long-term strategic plan in place so that when the next budget crisis happens, when it does, because you know the economy is volatile, we need to be prepared. And so you know one of the things that I um, have done, and you know, in my time in serving on boards, is uh, you know the strategic planning piece of this is to look at the the things that are unexpected uh, and to start turning over those rocks and thinking about the people that we know and the communities that we serve and other entities that might be able to create funding streams for our university system. Uh, it's so important to look at this as a long-term process so that we can solidify our Mr. university Corbett. system and hopefully shape the economy for Nevada. Mr. Corbett. Yeah, there's, 
And yes, there was, and, and, and I would agree with Ms. Uh, Stevens in terms of the, de the demographics. The financial support is definitely a different time now than it was 10 years ago. There's a currently study going on now, and there's presentations that are being, this Board of Regents hired a contractor to look strategically at what that looks like. One of the things that I'm hopeful of and appreciative of is that K-12 through is also doing a similar study in terms of their study and finding how you fund that. And so it's imperative that these things are happening simultaneously in our current environment to make sure that, okay, if we're where we're at now, let's make sure we identify the proper strategies, look at the multiple funding streams so we can collectively work together. It's time for us to look at a P through 20 system, preschool all the way up to the doctorate level so we can have comprehensively consistent support across the board. And I think the studies that are happening, I would be very disappointed if they didn't engage in that type of conversation. Quick follow up. It's obvious that 10 years ago and then the 23 years ago when the similar study was done that the university border re the border regents lived on a spend it all mentality because mm -hmm. obviously there was not a rainy day fund set up 10 years ago during the glory days. Do you promise not to perpetuate the spend it all mentality? 30 seconds. <laughs> <laughs> well, I think if we were going to look at um, the crisis that we're in today, I think we're spending it all and then a little bit more than what we really truly have. So when we move forward and we look at all of these proposals and we move into the strategic planning, absolutely, we need to make sure that we have a rainy day fund. Uh, it's just like me and my home and my uh, two children. Uh, it's not sustainable to just go through and every month spend every dime I have because what happens when my car breaks down the next month? So, you know, I think we just have to use some really practical, uh, common Sorry. sense advice in the way that we're approaching these problems. So I would agree with you. That was a yes promise. You promise not to have yeah, a spend Absolutely. It. Thank you. <laughs> You're up. Yeah, no, uh, yes, that would be a promise. But I also promise to continue to look at to make sure we're never in that position to have to hold true to the sense of we no longer have these funding streams. And so what I also promise is to continue to look at and engage in those conversations of multidisciplinary multi funding streams so that we can collectively be the community we deserve to be and be the community we are, we're destined to be, so to speak. And so the only way we do that is make that promise, but also simultaneously look at resources at the same time. Do we have, can I do one follow-up question? We've got about a minute. There's only one on the next panel, so yeah. Go ahead. Um, Mr. Corbett, your opponent said one of the things that would keep good teachers in the university or good professors would be to protect PERS. Do you agree with that? You know, what I agree with is to the extent of where they're at now, and, and as I shared earlier, where they're at now is we have professors who are engaging in personal phone bank uh, or food banks. And of course, as we look at, if you look at the human development across the board, and you look at Maslow's hierarchy of needs, you must have those needs met. And until those needs are met, we cannot be as effective. And so I think that conversation definitely needs to happen. Uh, I, don't, I think that right now, the, the, what's happened is that it's put them at risk. It's put the faculty at risk to teach our students effectively. And so do we need to have ongoing conversation about it? Absolutely. Uh, do the funding streams in the future, will that pertain to that and protect it potentially? Sure. But I think in terms of having that conversation, it's a long-term conversation to have. And I think we need to leave everything on the table in terms of how it impacts our faculty and how it will in fact impact our learning uh, environment to make sure we have a trained and educated workforce. Um, I'd like to ask a quick yes or no question as a student at UNLV. Um, could you tell me if you, and this is for both of you, uh, support the current funding formula proposal as advocated uh, by Chancellor Clayton? It's just a yes or no. <laughs> have you have you are, are you aware of the funding for I'm aware of it and I've looked at it and so what I'm trying to battle with is the yes or no. I think there's good parts of it. I think we need to look at other ways. I think it's better than what we have. Hopefully that's hopefully what's being proposed is not where we end up. That's a no. It, exactly. I don't, at this point, I can't say yes emphatically I agree with it, but I definitely agree with the direction that we're moving in, and I think it addresses some of the key uh, issues that we've faced. I, am I allowed to go back and clarify my point about PERS? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Okay, so that was a response. Time, so. 
quickly? Okay, so that was in response specifically to a question about recruitment. Right. And I do want to just clarify that when we're talking about new professors or new faculty that we're recruiting, we're not offering them $100,000 to teach three credits. So it is going to be important. When I apply for a job, I look at the benefits too. And so I do think that that is a key point in our recruitment strategy. Okay, thank you for the clarification. Thank you, Ms. Stevens and Mr. Corbett. Thank you. Thank you for coming.